Good morning, brothers and sisters. Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us yeah, you guys are pretty biblically literate. That's a wonderful thing. As we gather together this morning, the uh, last Sunday of the month will be Palm Sunday, and we'll be recognizing our first communicants then, right, Sarah? And so you'll hear more information about that. We're moving into the time of the year where a lot of exciting things will be happening in our midst. As we prepare our hearts to receive the best that the Lord has for us, in your bulletin you'll see our special Lenten verse that prepares our hearts to receive the goodness of God. So please rise as you're able, and we'll share our Lenten responsive reading. Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked abandon their ways. And the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord for mercy. To our God, who is generous and forgiving. All you who are thirsty, come to the water. You have no money. You who have no money, come receive bread and eat. Come without pain and without cost. Drink wine and milk. Praise be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all mercies, and the God of all consolation. And may we repeat together in unison that last verse, the congregational response. Praise, Praise be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all mercies, and the God of all consolation. May we rejoice triumphantly as we sing opening hymn number one, Rise Up, O Saints of God. today on this sunny day into your habitation here, our place of worship. And we pray now, Lord, that within every heart there would be a place for you, that you would reside within the repositories of every heart this day. Help us to rise up, Lord. There are many kingdom tasks to embrace, and we thank you and praise you, Lord, for calling us to be among that number who will rise up as saints of God. 
In your most precious name we pray. And all God's people join in saying, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So, Ron, you can kind of throttle the volume down here on this now. So, Mary and I received this as a gift that says, Christ or Jesus is the key. This looks like an old-fashioned key. How many of you have ever had one of these style keys to get into your house? None of you, because you're too young. This kind of key. I, I forget what they call them. They have a special name for these. And I can't escape them. What kind? Skeleton. Skeleton key. That's right. Mary and I were on our honeymoon. And uh, we had a skeleton key to get into our first house. And so we uh, were arriving back home and realized we didn't have the house keys. That my mother-in-law, God rest her soul, who was wonderful, had the house key. And it was a skeleton key. So we stopped at a hardware store somewhere in Arkansas or Mississippi, I forget which it was, realizing that we didn't have the key and we didn't want to disturb our mother-in-law. We just kind of wanted to be alone because we were newlyweds. And so we stopped at the hardware store and we asked, it was an old-fashioned one, we asked the guy if he had any skeleton keys and he said, yeah. And I said, well, we need one. And he said, well, let's look through this box. And he had a box of them and I found one that looked exactly like our house key. And so, he sold it to us for next to nothing, and we got home and it worked. And as we were leaving, he said, I probably ought not to do that. I ought not to sell you one of these, but when we explained that we were newlyweds and we wanted to go straight home, guess what he said? No problem. <laughs> that would never happen in 2021, and I doubt that they have these kind of keys anymore. But I especially like this one because it evoked that memory, but it's also very theological. Because, well, the young ladies and the young men, look up at the top. There are three circles that are kind of entwined, right? And they represent God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It's one thing, and yet it's distinct. And yet here you can see the unity of that symbol. So that's pretty cool, isn't it? So that's number one. There's some other signs on this. What is this here? The cross, right? And this over here, I think, is the empty tomb. Amen? Amen? The empty tomb, because once Christ was buried, he was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. And what a neat thing. So I wanted to share that with you today, and uh, I'm going to probably put it on a shelf at home like that, so that I can be reminded I didn't uh, remind Mary of that story, so later today when I go home, I'm going to remind her about that story and see if she remembers. Amen? Amen. Graceland gave me the biggest smile when we finished that song and she came out. If she's used to time for children being up here, we're going to get back to that one of these days, right? One of these days, hopefully not too soon. Amen. And amen. Brenda, it's all yours. Good morning. Good morning. We have uh, flowers both here and on the altar uh, from the funeral of Dale Weedmeyer. Our thoughts and prayers are with the family as the difficult days ahead. Um, the Restoration Committee will not be meeting today. We'll actually be meeting next week after church. <clears throat> We've had some unexpected things come up. Um, remember to uh, watch for your YouTube video of the midweek Linton service. Pastor's been doing an awesome job, and if you haven't had a chance to see a few of those, go and watch some of the ones from the beginning. They're really good, and they kind of tie all together, which is, makes it good. And then next Sunday is time change, spring ahead. Ethan is appreciating this, that he gets an extra hour at the bars next uh, Saturday, seeing he'll be 21. So I could use some prayers, because he's not going to be with me and drives me crazy. Um, let's see. 
We're also still looking for somebody to go to the LCMC uh, convention October 3rd through the 6th, which is in Ohio, which is near Columbus. It's not too far of a drive. Um, March mission of the month is Brecken Memory Center, and that's Dave uh, St. Clair that's in charge of that. So if there's any questions, Dave, do you have any comments to make on that? So. So you're going to give a reason each Sunday? Each Sunday there will be a notice in the bulletin. Okay, each Sunday there's going to be a notice for those that are listening outside um, about one of the services that they cover. Yeah. Uh, the Thrivent Choice Dollars deadline, that's a big long blurb there from Julie Shibley. Please take a moment to read that. It is really important and something that will benefit the church um, from that. <laughs> And I think Shirley has something that she wants to say. Well, this really isn't an announcement. <laughs> Sorry, Brenda. It's a God nudge, a God moment. Um, sometime in January, I was having a very, very bad day. Everything was going wrong. Um, nothing was going right. It was, I was having probably a good old pity party. And I got onto Facebook, and my good friend, Carolyn Wild Raleigh, who some of you know, had posted something, and it just, that was it. It just smacked me in the, in the face and said, okay, Shirley, this is, this is what you needed to hear at that moment. I referred back to that several times. I even typed it up because I was afraid I was going to lose it on my phone. And in the middle of the night last night, I woke up and that was what was on, that was my mind, was this post. I thought, okay, I, you know, went to bed pretty, you know, easily. Woke up this morning, there it was again. I said, okay, God, are you telling me that you need to share it? So I'm going to share it with you. One of the things that I thought about this morning was the Restoration Committee, which I am part of. And we really are striving to have a... Uh, um, an opinion of what you want, what you don't want, what you like, what you don't like. And we're really working toward to get that out to you so that we can have that back. And I don't know, this sort of just, again, entered my mind. So it's very short, very sweet, but it's to the point. One Sunday morning at a small southern church, the new pastor called on one of his older deacons to lead in the opening prayer. The deacon stood up, bowed his head, and said, Lord, I hate buttermilk. <laughs> the pastor opened one eye and wondered where this was going. The deacon continued, Lord, I hate lard. Now the pastor was totally perplexed. The deacon continued, Lord, I ain't too crazy about plain flour, but after you mix them all together and bake them in a hot oven, I just love biscuits. So Lord, help us to realize when life gets hard, when things come up that we don't like, whenever we don't understand what you are doing, that we need to wait and see what you are making. After you get through mixing and baking, it's probably going to be even something better than biscuits. So keep that in mind. Amen and amen. Wow, perfectly spoken and um, for us on the committee, something we've been really struggling with and I hope that all of you, once we get to the point where we can present to you, will understand and understand why. Maybe we don't like buttermilk, but we all love biscuits. So hopefully we'll be all in this together. <clears throat> Is there any other announcements that I missed or need to be spoken? 
All right, so let's see, birthdays. And looks like Stuart is yeah, the only... Tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> Stuart's birthday is tomorrow. I don't see anybody else here, and I don't think we missed anybody from last week. Oh, Gary, you thought you were going to skip out on us? <laughs> well, I give you permission to party from now until your birthday. How about that? All right. So we are going to sing to Stuart and Gary. Along with uh, restoration comes the context of renewal. And that's what God intends for each one of our lives. That would be, we would be renewed in the faith in a remarkable way, in uh, circumstances beyond our control. Shirley is testifying there as well as making an announcement. That was a twofold announcement, right? A testimony and an announcement reminded me that many of you have testimonies about how the Lord has moved upon your hearts during difficult times. And you don't have to share anything sophisticated. You can just stand up, let Brenda know if you'd like to do that around announcement time. I think that would be a good thing, right, Brenda, to be able to do that, to have testimony, just like Shirley shared, going through a, a darker period, a shadowy period, and the Lord ministered to her by our dear friend Carolyn Raleigh who, by the way, can hear the broadcast on the radio, she said. So she's a part of us, even if she's not here in physical form. So I heard Mary laughing, and when I came down to see what she was laughing about, she had been watching Joel Osteen, and he told a little joke this morning that I found kind of sexist, but she loved it. And it goes this way. Adam was talking to God, and, God, and Adam said to God, God, why did you make Eve so beautiful? And God said, so you'd love her. Why did you create her with long, beautiful hair and a wonderful figure? And God said, so you would love her. And then uh, Adam said to God, and so God, why did you create me? And uh, he said, because you needed her. And because you're so dumb, I wanted her to love you. Think about that. Mary thought that was great. I wonder why. <laughs> Please rise as you're able for the reading of God's Word. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their table. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers, overturning their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. And his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. And after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. And when Jesus was in Jerusalem during the Passover festival, many believed in his name because they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, would not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to testify about anyone, for he himself knew what was in everyone. May God add a rich blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated at this time. So Jesus was very discerning in difficult times. Now John places this at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, 
Whereas when you read other gospel writings, it's a little bit later in his ministry. And so I've often thought that he probably, throughout the three years traditionally afforded him for ministry, that he probably went to Jerusalem numerous times. And so this was one of those occasions. So today's text, we, um, some of us, a few of us at uh, the seminary where I'm attending, we do uh, Thursday lunchtime Lexio. Lexio Divina means sacred readings. And you read the text three times and you see what speaks to you. And I think that we may have done that here in an abbreviated way a couple of weeks ago. The amazing thing for me when I was focusing on Lexio this week, when we read this very passage, a bizarre thing occurred to me. Where in the world did Jesus get all those cords that he used to make a whip? The story doesn't tell us that, does it? He's a lot like Mark in that regard. He just gives us the basics of the text. So I had to think to myself, there must have been a lot of cattle that were running around free in the temple. Amen? Because I think he probably got, they had oxen in those days, not cattle like we would have today. There was probably some cattle that were set free so that he could make that cord of whips and move the money changers out. And so that occurred to me, which I never thought about reading the scripture all those years. But why would he do that? Why would Jesus go in and clean the temple in that way? Well, most scholars now think that where they set up the money changers and where they sold animals for animal sacrifice in the temple, it wouldn't have been inside of the inner courts, it would have been in the outer courts, probably around the colonnade, if you ever get to see a model of what it looks like, and some of your Bibles may have that. It was in the outer courts that people would gather for prayer if they were being drawn to God. People from all over Africa, from all over the Mediterranean, if they were being drawn to the Lord, they were considered proselytes. But proselytes, not having been instructed in the things of God, would not have been permitted in any of the inner areas. And of course, only the, the priests went into the inner sanctum, the inner court. So, you have all of these people buying and selling in this area around the outer court. That meant that the people who were being drawn close to God were being shoved away. And when you think about it, there are a lot of people that we know that may not be religious, but may somehow being drawn to the Lord. And somehow they may be, they, or they may feel that they're being shoved away. So we want to have our gospel antenna out so that we can find out where and how we can minister to those individuals out in the outer courts. And so Jesus came and there was all this buying and selling going on and he cleared the area. And they knew that scripture, the disciples knew that scripture that zeal for God would consume him. Zeal for God would lead Jesus to the cross so that he would die for you and for each one of us and for all of us. And that's what we contemplate during Lent. And Jesus was doing a new thing, something fresh, something renewed yet true, reflecting what was old and now was being made anew. Because animal sacrifice wouldn't need to be done anymore. When Jesus was crucified, animal sacrifice in the temple was done away with. Because just a few years after Jesus' time, the temple was destroyed by the Romans. And if you go to Israel today, you can see rocks stacked up where the temple used to be, still there. But Jesus became for us that one-time sacrifice so that as we identify with his shed blood, our lives can be swept clean like he swept the outer courts. Jesus was doing something brand new, renewed yet true. A new thing, something fresh, reflecting what was old, and now new because sacrifice would be transformed by the ministry of Jesus. Once raised from the dead, the only sacrifice that the followers of Jesus would need would be the sacrifice of praise and thankful hearts. And that's what we offer in worship. When we have Holy Communion, that's not a sacrifice. That is a remembrance, a feast that remembers what was, bringing it into the present so that we can be made a brand new and afresh for what will be. 
the sacrifice that we offer now is not blood sacrifice. It's the sacrifice of praise in worship. And that's why I love to hear the hymns. And stop, stop sometimes so I can hear each one of you singing because I love to hear the voices raised in sacrifice and praise. And that's what we do now. When we know and are embraced by the story of Jesus, when we know the narrative, and that's important, repentance and forgiveness follow. And that's what we're doing today, focusing on the narrative. Mary and I love to watch a show that is a Canadian series on television. It's called Heartland. I don't know if any of you have ever watched that. Have you watched it, Gisela? And they recently started a new series. Did you get to see the newer one? No. Uh, there was kind of a lag between the two years. It's the story of these people that have a wonderful ranch. And uh, they raise and train horses. And it's, uh, I really heartily, heartily recommend that if you have the opportunity and you have access to cable or whatever. It's on Netflix, I think. But I wouldn't swear to it. Netflix? So... We were watching the show one day and I got really frustrated because it had been a couple of years and I couldn't remember the narrative thread and I couldn't remember some of the things that had transpired and I was really frustrated and then God spoke to me and said, that's probably how a lot of people feel when they hear about symbols like we talked about symbols last week or the key that I held up today that was a wonderful gift. People that don't know the narrative thread are, are frustrated. So God spoke to me and said, you got to share a little of the narrative thread that the temple sacrifice was going away and they no longer needed to buy and sell. And that place of prayer was crowded with all kinds of merchandise and people couldn't press in and they needed to press in. There were a lot of proselytes back in that era because they were seeking the living God and some of them didn't know it. Many people today are seeking the living God and don't know it. And it's up to us to tell them the narrative thread that Jesus came to die once for all and that he would be raised from the dead. That's the Easter victory. That he would be raised for us so that we could have renewed life. So that as surely as testimony fit in so well, in those moments when you look at a lump of flour or you look at uh, lard or you look at what the other ingredient was? Butter. You wonder, what, what, how is this all going to fit together? God's going to do some kind of new work in our lives when we need it the most. So that was the first step. And maybe that's why John puts that first. That was the first step. Jesus was coming into the temple to say something fresh is coming. A new thing is coming. God is going to do a great thing in the lives of his people. And it will spread all throughout the Mediterranean world within a couple of years and all throughout the world before the end of time. He was clearing the way. Keith Wagner writes, When Jesus entered the temple, that day he found a faith that was stale. What Jesus did, I, he continues on, believe, was to challenge a smug, hypocritical religious system that needed to change. Therefore, a little demolition was necessary. The faith community at that time was wrapped up in rules and rituals, and they needed a fresh revelation of God. In the story, we get an image of Jesus as the one-man wrecking crew swinging a spiritual sledgehammer. But most importantly, the faith community needed a fresh start. And Jesus took it upon himself to do that with zeal and with determination. Restoration and renewal. Right, Brenda? Go hand in hand because we are in the early phases of the 21st century. And we want to be winsome for Christ. Some of my friends here will remember Pastor Dave Woodby always used to say, be winsome for Christ. And that's what he wants. That we'd be winsome, attractive. People want to come in and be a part of what we're doing here. Be fulfilled with the promise of Jesus. Yeah, these are discouraging times and people are discouraged. And it doesn't take much to discourage us with all of the things that have been taking place and the restrictions and so forth. 
And a young lady by the name of Causey White back in March of 2009 wrote this, if you want to feel rich, count all of the things that you have that money cannot buy. Count all of the things that you have that money cannot buy. And when we look around at one another, we realize that the relationships that we have are things that money can't buy. The relationships that we have one with another are precious in the eyes of the Lord. And that's why he creates us to be a part, a very important part of the body of Christ. God intends we have a fresh perspective on our relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and by with one another, reckoning with what we have as the people of God and what we are. In one article that I got back on my birthday, February 8th, a Monday memo went this way. An ancient Eastern proverb says, those who drink the water must remember who dug the well. When you look around at our sanctuary, remember, we're drinking in the water, but there are a lot of people that dug the well. Amen? Amen. Forebearers that were here. And then when we look at our own personal lives, there are a lot of people that poured into our lives the faith that we cling to today in difficult times. In every area, our lives are made lighter through the efforts of others. Take a look around. Everything that you see is a call for gratitude. The house that you live in, clothes, your table, your chair, your bed. Someone tug, dug the well, so to speak, to make these available. And there were also those who taught in your schools, who taught Sunday school, who told you about Jesus, who took you to youth camp or retreats who prayed for you, who encouraged you along the way. They were digging the well, and they deserve your gratitude. Our job, then, is to remember to remember those who put the well in its place, to say thank you in person when we can, and to say thank you to God for bringing this person our way. And our job goes just a little bit further. We need to be digging wells of our own in service to others. It's a simple task to ask ourselves throughout the day, who besides me will benefit from what I'm doing right now? During his second and third missionary journeys, the Apostle Paul dug a well in Ephesus, planting a church, leading people to Christ, training leaders, and yet it is he who expressed gratitude to them. I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Ephesians 1.16. And I would add to that in my own prayers. I do not cease to give thanks for you, every single one of you and those listening in by the miracle of modern technology, remembering you in my prayers. Our work involves digging deep wells that will last for eternity. Let's tend to the task in a spirit of gratitude, thankful for those whom we serve and thankful for those who have played a role in guiding us along the way, Steve May. So on Friday of this past week, I had an opportunity to minister to the family of a man who died in prison. And they were deeply in need of hearing the word of God. And when I'm in those contexts, I'm not just some lone ranger out there doing this kind of ministry because I'm under your covering. When uh, I do funerals, I usually insist that they list Pastor Drex, Pastor St. John's, Bridgewater Church, because I'm an ambassador for Christ on your behalf. And each one of us is likewise an ambassador for Christ, representing our body of Christ, because when churches and pastors get off the track in ministry and do dumb things, it's because there's no accountability. There's no sense of, yeah, I'm representing a family of God who holds me responsible. Many of us have been in prisons, literally, figuratively, of one sort or another, and yet God frees us, and you are free, or you wouldn't be here today. God wants you to feel that freedom. Once freed, the Lord intends us in Christ to free others with the good news of Jesus, knowing the narrative that he came to set the captive free. And that's us, so that we can in turn share that with others. 
because we live in perilous times. And so that's the fresh thing that we can be involved with wherever and however now in this day and time in which we live. That's the fresh thing that God wants us to be a part of. Because in Luke's gospel, right after Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, he went to his home synagogue and shared the following words. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and blind of sight, recovery of sight for those who are blind, to release the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Sometimes when you read the news, you feel like, well, we're not experiencing the Lord's favor. But we are, amen? We are those who are gathered here, and we're ambassadors for good news wherever we go so that the Lord's spirit might be poured out in a powerful way, and that while we restore, we might be renewed. Sisters and brothers, this is what we're called to do as we leave from here, as Yvonne Falk, Pastor Falk's wife, so long ago had that vision that skeletons were putting on flesh and they were going out the front door and they were going out into the street. I think she foresaw a time such as this. That's the fresh thing that we can be involved with. Now is the time to focus, to bring hope, to bring comfort, to bring a renewed vision of sharing a vital trust in Jesus because that's why we're here and what we're called to do to the glory of Christ. Amen. May we rise to our feet as we're able as we sing our next hymn.
rejoice and be glad. Yours is the kingdom of God. And as you go, wherever it is you go, many people will find that persuasive as they see you transformed by the power and the presence of God. So the narrative thread can be found in the Apostles' Creed. Join with me, if you will, as printed in the bulletin that shares the story of who we are and whose we are. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we move into a time of prayer, I'm wondering if any of you suddenly thought about somebody that dug a well to allow you to, to partake of the waters of everlasting life, living waters. Did any of you think of somebody who was a forebearer or someone who dug a well for you? If so, then raise your hand. I'm not going to call on anybody, but yeah, almost a majority of the people this morning have thought about somebody who dug a well so that we could drink out of everlasting living waters. And for me, I'll share, it was Pastor Walt Smith in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, pastor from Pennsylvania who went to Louisiana to establish a house church. We actually met in the house. And he saw something in me and encouraged me to go to seminary. And so he dug a well. And I'm drinking of that water and we're drinking of that together today. And so as we pray this morning, remember those individuals, maybe more than one, who dug a well and helped you to be here today among the people of God. May we pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for those who've gone on before, our forebearers of the faith, those who, when they were challenged, weren't victims but victors. We thank you for our forebearers of the faith. And we thank you for their unprecedented touch upon every heart and every life. We continue to intercede for Ruth and Ralph Myers. We pray for Clemma Kruger, who's home and wants to be back with us very soon. We pray for the family of Dale Weedmeyer and all who mourn on this occasion as we remember Dale's contribution to our lives in such profound ways. We lift up those who received bad news from doctors and we know Lord that even when we receive bad news from doctors that you have the final say so so I lift up Kathy Lowry Ron's wife Amy's good friend Kate we pray Lord that you would continue to minister to Gail Curtis that you would minister powerfully to Douglas Lodge and Skip Aldridge to my classmates Chris McFadden and Jeremy Smith and all who have been affected in any way shape or form by COVID Bob Balmer, my good friend. Lord, in your mercy. We lift up Gisela and others, Claudia, who will be traveling, the Schwingles who are traveling even now. And as this season unfolds and we begin to relax just a wee bit, Lord, help keep us safe. Help protect us as we begin to move out and about. Lord, in your mercy. And there may be others, Lord, that we want to mention before your throne of mercy in this hour. And we pray for ourselves too, Lord, that we will be a part of the solution and not the problem as we face all kinds of unprecedented things in that wider world out there. Lord, in your mercy. And now into your hands, Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus our Lord, who taught us each to pray, saying, Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And to lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, in the night in which our Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it for each disciple to eat, saying, This is my body given for you, take and eat, and do so for the remembrance of me. And then again after supper, when he had given thanks, he gave them each the cup to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. As often as we eat the bread and drink from the cup, we proclaim the resurrection power of our Lord Jesus Christ until he comes again for us on clouds of glory. You may be seated. At this time, we'll uh, come to you with Holy Communion, and uh, we extend uh, the offer to participate in this holy meal to any who know Jesus as Lord of their lives. Please rise as you're able. And now may the body and the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, may it comfort, strengthen, and keep each one of us in God's grace. Amen. So yesterday I was called in to do a, a service just kind of at the last minute because something had fallen through. And it was for a woman who had been a Christian, lived 102 years. Wow. She lived not through one, but two pandemics. Lived through a Great Depression, lived through two, well, one world war. And when you think about it in all these subsequent police actions or undeclared wars, and yet she was not a victim, even with all of the sadness in her life, she was a victor. And that's what will be said about every single one of you. Because living through this, especially our kids, these little ones, living through this, they will be the next greatest generation for Jesus. Amen? Amen? Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon each of you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon us all as he grants us his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of God's Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. May we rejoice as we can share together our concluding hymn. Jesus' name. Thanks be to God.